A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. On the following Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and with violent abuse contradicted what Paul said. Both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and condemn yourselves as unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth, the Gentiles were delighted when they heard this and glorified the word of the Lord. All who were destined for eternal life came to believe, and the word of the Lord continued to spread through the whole region. The Jews, however, incited the women of prominence who were worshipers and the leading men of the city, stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their territory. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Urbum Domini. All the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand has won victory for him, his holy arm. All the enemies of the earth have seen the saving power of God. The Lord has made his salvation known. In the sight of the nations, he has revealed his justice. He has remembered his kindness and his faithfulness towards the house of Israel. All the enemies of the earth have seen the All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation by our God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Break into song, sing praise. All the ends of the earth have seen the Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Ioannem. Jesus said to his disciples, If you know me, then you will also know my Father. From now on you do, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. 
Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and will do greater ones than these, because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything of me in my name, I will do it. Verbum Domini. Today is truly a beautiful day in honor of our Blessed Mother, who 100 years ago appeared for the first time to the three little children in Fatima, Portugal, in 1917. And we know that before Our Lady came, the Angel of Peace appeared three times to the little children uh, in the previous year to prepare them uh, for this visit uh, from heaven. But Our Lady is described this way by one of the visionaries. We had Sister Lucia, who is a 10-year-old a girl, and then her two cousins, uh, Francisco and Jacinta, who are brother and sister. And Francisco is eight years old, and Jacinta only seven years old. And these two little ones, Francisco and Jacinta, were just canonized in Fatima. We have two new little saints, um, something that has been known in heaven for a long time, but that the church has today acknowledged. And so to ask for their intercession, uh, that we may be like them in, in following uh, and heeding the call of our Blessed Mother. But Lucia, the 10-year-old uh, who lived up, you know, long, she didn't die that long ago, um, she gave this description of what Our Lady looked like. And they, she said this, a lady clothed in white, brighter than the sun, radiating a light more clear and intense than a crystal cup filled with sparkling water lit by burning sunlight. And so these little children stood there amazed, bathed in this light that surrounded this apparition of our Blessed Mother. And she said that Our Lady smiled at them. And she told them, do not be afraid, I will not harm you. And they asked what anybody would ask, you know, the innocence, especially the little children. Where are you from? You know, who are you? That's what they wanted to know. And the lady pointed to the sky and said, I come from heaven. And now the little children ultimately, after seeing this beautiful vision of Our Lady, they wanted to go where she went. And that's one of the questions they asked her will we go to heaven? And our Blessed Mother did promise them that Francisco and Jacinta will go to heaven very soon. And Lucia had to stick around for a while in order to promote and help us uh, understand a greater devotion to the Immaculate Heart. Um, but if I think if any of us saw a glimpse of heaven, we'd all want to go there immediately. And this is such a, a beautiful thing. Our Lady tells them, do not be afraid. I, I have not come to harm you. It's very important for us to remember that anyone who comes from heaven would say the same thing to us. And this is the voice of our mother. I have not come to harm you. And Lucia recounted that at that same moment as they were having this interaction with this lady from heaven, that our Blessed Mother opened her hands and a stream of uh, light came upon the children, which allowed them, allowed them to see themselves in God. And again, this uh, knowledge of ourselves, the way heaven sees us. And she invited them to pray the rosary every day to bring peace to the world and the end of the war. Now, if we want to know what Our Lady was asking in Fatima, she asked them to come every month
from May through October. And this is what we hear in those messages, amongst other things. But in May, of May 13th of 1917, uh, she said, say the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world. In June of 1917, she said, I want you to say the rosary every day. In July 13th of 1917, what did she say? I want you to continue saying the rosary every day. And in August, a very similar thing. I want you to continue saying the rosary every day. September, I think you could say it right with me, continue saying the rosary to obtain the end of the war. And in October 13th, when the beautiful uh, miracle of the sun took place, she again reminded the children, I want you to continue saying the rosary every day. This is how a mother trains her children. It's by repetition. So we say it this time, we say it again, we say it again. So there's not one of us that can question, now, why did Our Lady come to us in Fatima and what was she asking of us to do? Pray the rosary every day. And she would identify herself as Our Lady of the Rosary. And the beautiful basilica there in Fatima is dedicated to her under that title, Our Lady of the Rosary. We're very blessed here uh, with uh, this image, this pilgrim image of Our Lady of Fatima that uh, is in our chapel throughout the year. But um, just a few months ago, we had a, a friend who used to live in Rome and is a, a, great, a great devotee of Our Blessed Mother. And he told us that uh, they had to do not that long ago some um, kind of reconstruction work where they opened the place under the site where Our Lady had appeared in 1917, and they uh, removed some of the stone. And they decided to make a number of rosaries out of that stone under the apparition site, and he was privileged to receive one of those rosaries, and he shared it with us. So we have for a time the rosary around our Blessed Mother's hands, is stone under the place where she appeared. We know she appeared over that little holm oak tree uh, in Fatima to the children. But underneath there uh, today in the excavation they did, um, that is the ro this rosary there on our, the statue of Our Lady is stone from uh, the site of Fatima where she appeared. Um, so it's a, a, a link for us to be uh, in that holy sanctuary where Our Lady appeared. I want to just, uh, in the homily today, use some words from St. John Paul II. We know that St. John Paul had a tremendous love for our Blessed Mother, uh, and that a year after his, the assassination attempt on his life, that he went to the sanctuary at Fatima to thank Our Lady, to make a, a visible act of recognition, and he recognized that uh, in this assassination attempt on May 13th, 1981, that Our Lady had saved his life or had been instrumental in sparing him. And so he wanted to thank her and acknowledge uh, her intercession. And these are some words from his homily that I think can help all of us in our own devotion to our Blessed Mother. On that occasion of his visit, they used the scripture passage, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his, home, to his own home. And he points out, this is St. John Paul II, he says that it was he, John, the son of Zebedee, the apostle and evangelist, who heard from the cross the words of Christ, behold your mother, but first, Christ had said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. As he left this world, Christ gave to his mother a man, a human being, to be like a son for her, John. He entrusted him to her. And as a consequence of this giving and entrusting, Mary became the mother of John. The mother of God became the mother of man. 
In John, every human being became her child. This is something that we speak of often in uh, our life of devotion uh, to the mother of Christ. That in that act, uh, we're all entrusted to her care. And St. John Paul II goes on, he says, Mary's motherhood in our regard is manifested in, our, in a particular way in the places where she meets us, in her dwelling places, places in which a special presence of the mother is felt. And so he's going to play on those words, and from that hour the disciple took her to his home. St. John Paul II says there are many such dwelling places. They are, all, they are of all kinds. From a special corner in the home or a little wayside shrine adorned with an image of the mother of God to chapels and churches built in her honor. However, in certain places, the mother's presence is felt in a particularly vivid way. And these places sometimes radiate their light over a great distance and draw people from afar. And so he would go on to speak of uh, Jasna Gora in Poland, which uh, was the site of great devotion to our Blessed Mother in his homeland of Poland. He made reference to Lourdes. And then he said, and here we are in Fatima, you know, that many people are drawn to this site on pilgrimage. But he's making the connection that many people can't go to a long distances to travel all the way to Fatima. But we have these little roadside shrines, or we have in our homes a little uh, corner dedicated to our Blessed Mother, and that we go there and we pray. And he says this, in all these places, that unique testament of the crucified Lord is wonderfully actualized. In them, man feels that he is entrusted and confided to Mary. He goes there in order to be with her as with his mother. He opens his heart to her and speaks to her about everything. He takes her to his own home. That is to say, he brings her into all his problems, which at times are difficult. His own problems and those of others the problems of the family, of societies, of nations, and of the whole of humanity. Now think of what we do with our own mother, almost very different than we do in our relationship with our dads. Now when you're in school, I don't know what the rest of you did, but when I was in college and having to take an exam, I knew my parents' phone number by heart in that moment and would pick up the phone and I wanted to get my mother on the phone. And what would I say? I have this big exam tomorrow, pray, you know? And of course I'd ask my father to pray for me. My dad would ask me the logical question. <laughs> Have you studied? <laughs> uh, have you been doing your work? You know, but my mother, of course, would say, certainly, you know. Then you'd get a note later, predated email. You know, I hope you did well on your exam. Even in seminary, I remember doing the same thing. These are the exam dates. You get the syllabus at the beginning of the semester. Hey, mom, put these, cal these dates on your calendar and pray, you know, pray uh, for, for me on those days. Isn't it almost instinctual that we turn to the gentleness, the maternity of our mothers, this care, this maternal care, and confide ourselves uh, to her care? And this is what the Lord knew. We don't honor our Blessed Mother as a person of the Trinity. We do not pray to her as if she's God. We pray to her as a friend, just like we ask any friend to intercede for us. But we pray to her with a special fervency compared to the other saints, other holy people, because she was chosen by God to be the mother of his son. 
And so she had, she shared this intimate relationship with Jesus in her life, unusual uh, or very different from everyone else, and yet what each of us is invited to. And so we look to her and we say, I want that same relationship with Jesus that you had. I want that same intimacy with him that you had. I want that same knowledge of him that you had. And Jesus honors that by saying from the cross, you know, behold your mother, uh, telling us turn to her and giving her to us in entrusting her to the care of John who represents all of us, as St. John Paul II points out. Now, some people feel that the message of Our Lady of Fatima, uh, they can be fearful about what Our Lady showed the children or what, he, what she asked of them. And I think it's not necessary. Again, what did she say to them in her first apparition? She told them they had nothing to be afraid of. I'm from heaven. You don't have anything to be afraid of. I'm coming from God to talk to you. And St. John Paul II helps us understand this. He says, in looking at the messages of Fatima, he says, if the church has accepted the message of Fatima, it is above all because that message contains a truth and a call whose basic content is the truth and the call of the gospel itself. And this is what Our Lady wants. If we start living her messages or what she invites us to, ultimately what our Blessed Mother is always asking us to do is to live the gospel, live the life of Christ, and live what Jesus teaches you in the scripture. But lest we can't comprehend that, she makes it very simple for us. Again, as a mother would, breaks it down for her children and draws us in to this life of the gospel. So St. John Paul II points this out. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. These are the first words that the Messiah addressed to humanity. The message of Fatima is in its basic nucleus a call to conversion and repentance as in the gospel. The call to repentance is a motherly one and at the same time, it is strong and decisive. The call to repentance is linked, as always, with the call to prayer. In harmony with the tradition of many centuries, the Lady of the Message indicates the Rosary, which can rightly be defined as Mary's prayer, the prayer in which she feels particularly united with us. She herself prays with us, and the rosary embraces the problems of the church, of the see of St. Peter, the problems of the whole world. And in it, we also remember sinners that they may be converted and saved and the souls in purgatory. And so he's pointing out that this is a mother's heart. Everyone is to be saved. No one is to be lost. No mother desires that her child sees damnation. Every, my, every mother desires earnestly the salvation of the souls of their children. And so if Mary is identified as our mother given to us, as our mother uh, by Jesus, that's what she desires for us. And that her concern, as she prays with us, her concern is every problem. She embraces the entire church. She embraces the Sea of Peter, the problems of the whole world, as St. John Paul II says. And this is how he goes on, and this is what I would close with in the homily. He says, in the light of a mother's love, we understand the whole message of the lady at Fatima. The greatest obstacle to man's journey towards God is sin, perseverance in sin, and finally, the denial of God. The deliberate blotting out of God from the, from the world of human thought the detachment from him of the whole of man's earthly activity, the rejection of God by man. Can the mother, who with all the force of the love that she fosters in the Holy Spirit, desires everyone's salvation, keep silence on what undermines the very basis of their salvation? 
No, she cannot. That's what St. John Paul II says. Can she remain silent? No, absolutely not. And so while the message of Our Lady of Fatima is a motherly one, it is also strong and decisive. It sounds severe. It sounds like John the Baptist speaking on the banks of the Jordan. It invites us to repentance. It gives us a warning. It calls us to prayer. It recommends the rosary. Her care extends to every individual of our time and to all the societies, nations, and peoples. So societies menaced by apostasy, threatened by moral degradation, the collapse of morality involves the collapse of societies. And so our Blessed Mother is instrumental in helping us uh, and reminding us we need to change this course. And that begins with each of us to change our hearts. This is what these little children, 10 years old, 8 years old, and 7 years old, heard from Our Lady, that conversion begins with me, and I have this relationship with the Lord. I pray the rosary every day. I meditate on the mysteries of the life of Christ. And in that, I begin to pray for the salvation of the whole world. I share with Our Lady her concern for all mankind. And I pray for the conversion of everyone, that no one may be lost and all may come to know Jesus.